The story of Rebel News' efforts to help Christians in northern Iraq starts back in 2017. My boss, Ezra Levant, was shown a Christian prayer book written in Aramaic, the language that Christ spoke, that the Islamic State had tried to rip up. And when the Islamic State couldn't rip it up because it was so thick, they then used it for target practice. The book was found in the Christian town of Batnaya in Iraqi Kurdistan, a place just 15 kilometers from the Islamic State capital city of Mosul. The town on the biblical Nineveh plain, the cradle of Christianity, had fallen behind the Islamic State front lines. The Christian homes in Batnaya were marked with the Arabic symbol Nun, denoting they were Nazarenes, followers of Christ. The Christians there were forced to leave or die. Their homes were destroyed, their churches were defiled and desecrated, covered in ISIS graffiti or worse. They were used as training bases, the steeples of the churches used as snipers' nests. Even the Christian dead were not left to rest in peace. The cemetery in Batnaya was also destroyed by ISIS. The Christians were then and are now being ethnically cleansed throughout the Middle East from their indigenous lands. And the plight of the Christians in their ancestral homelands gets almost no media attention. While the media and governments around the world trip over themselves to tell the stories of those affected by the Syrian civil war, Christians at the very same time were being butchered in their homes and in their towns and in their churches in northern Iraq, and no one really seemed to know or care. So in 2017, Rebel News sent a documentary team to northern Iraq to document the plight of the Christian communities there and perhaps maybe find a way to help them. A documentary team met with refugees, the survivors of the Islamic State genocide, women and girls who were captives, forced to watch their husbands and fathers killed and then become Islamic State rape slaves because of their faith in Christ. Our team delivered aid and toured destroyed Christian villages, documenting the ISIS graffiti written in German in the Chaldean Catholic Church in Batnaya. And our team brought the untold stories of suffering and forgotten Christians back home where they needed to be heard. From that 2017 trip came our 2018 full-length documentary, Save the Christians, the Forgotten Refugees. Alongside that documentary came a highly successful fundraising campaign. Recently, we have partnered with the Nazarene Fund, quietly delivering the proceeds of our Save the Christians campaign to an organization we knew that we could trust that was working in the region to get help to the people who needed it the most in a low trust part of the world. We wanted to work with a charity we knew already had a strong track record of delivering tangible aid to Christians in the Middle East. And so for us, the Nazarene Fund was a good fit. However, at Rebel News, we are also accountability journalists. And we are also accountable to the people who entrust us with their money to do what we say we will do with it. So, at the end of November 2019, unannounced, I quietly left my comfortable home and my loving family in Canada for the opportunity of a lifetime. I traveled to Iraqi Kurdistan to do some accountability journalism on ourselves, to see where those generous fundraising dollars were going, to see what difference they were making, if any, in the lives of the survivors of the Islamic State genocide. And I wanted to do something else, if I could. I wanted to continue our fundraising efforts if indeed I saw that we were making a difference. I wanted to give the gift of religious freedom to a few more families as an advent project for Rebel News. I set out to document everything I saw, everything I did and everyone I spoke to using my microphone and just a selfie stick and my cell phone in the short time that I was there. We were moving quickly from place to place with a security team watching over my every move. I arrived in Erbil, Iraqi Kurdistan, and met with the Nazarene Fund's in-country contractors from White Mountain Research, and we made the two-hour drive to Dohuk. The following morning, we were at a secure hotel that was being used to process Christian and Yazidi refugees. At this one hotel, they were processing about 2,000 Christian refugees per week, and the day I was there, the aid workers were preparing the refugee paperwork for nearly 200 people, both Christian and Yazidis. I had been warned the night before that I would see and hear some horrible things, that I would see mothers 
signing away their parental rights so that their children could make it out of the country to safety. My name is Sharb Al Shami. I'm the project manager for uh, everything we're doing here. Uh, basically, what we're doing is after rescuing all these people, we'll bring them here to Kurdistan to an hotel here. And there's a team who comes to fill all their applications so they can apply for the Australian embassy. So basically what we're doing is taking their stories, what happened to them, filling uh, all kind of forms that the embassy requests, the Australian embassy requests. And then we take this file to the embassy. They proceed it, then there's other steps. We take them to the interviews, to the IUM, until they get their visa and be able to travel to a safer place to Australia. Now, I have to be very careful about taking their photos. Uh, why is that? Because uh, a lot of them has been rescued recently, especially the one that uh, that escaped or was released from Bagos and uh, Camp Al Hol, which was recently freed from ISIS. So uh, a lot of them just came from ISIS and uh, they are afraid. Actually, there's a lot of risk on, of them. If, say, their face go on media, they could be uh, traced by ISIS and killed, especially that a lot of them have information. A lot of them have been with emirs and uh, big people in ISIS. That's that's why, mostly why. Now, you're also screening uh, these refugees. You're also screening them for extremism because some of them have been with ISIS for so long. Yes, yes. We're, this is one of the, our main job here, is to investigate everything. Because, you know, the, the brainwashing, especially for small children, and there's a lot of, not a lot, and there's few women who got, who felt in love with their kidnappers. So our job is to specify these people and to highlight them to the embassy and to others. So what happens from here? So you're starting their paperwork work here. You're going to see about 200 refugees today. What, where do they go from here? Actually, it's around... Yeah, around, uh, we have around 50 families today, which is more than 200. And uh, as I told you, from here, when, they, when we filled everything, we were going to send the files to the Australian Embassy. And uh, the Australian Embassy will proceed their files, and then they will call them again for another interview uh, directly with the, uh, with the Australian. And then they will go to medicals, do their med medicals and then they will be granted the visa. Some of these families have been through quite a lot. Um, do you have any stories to share? I know they don't want to talk to me on camera. There's a lot of stories, there's a lot of breaking, uh, heartbreaking stories. And, uh, most of these women have been sold many times, have been raped, have been beaten, mistreated. And uh, if, you can see, if you can read and hear the stories, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking really. The, the, the trauma they've been to the life and it's amazing they can they are still able to continue their life they are still you can a lot of them don't don't even smile and until now after they've been released for like six months or one year or even two years and they still don't smile you can see their faces it's uh, and it, 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 it's impossible what happened in this 21 century in the, 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 the savageness that happened is unbelievable unacceptable um, a lot of these refugees, I would say 75% of them are children. Is that what you're seeing across the board? Uh, there's a lot of children, mostly uh, that came with their... And there's a lot of children who were kidnapped with their mothers. There's a lot of women, actually, also. Uh, the children were taken, were separated from their women, from their uh, mothers. Uh, the older one, yani, around 8, 9, 10... 10 years old, they were taken and uh, and they were trained on weapons, how to use weapons. They were uh, taught uh, Quran and Muslim Sharia. Uh, the older one, 12, 13, were even sent to battles. And I have one child here, he's like, he's 15 now, but back then he was like 12 or 13 years old. He was forced to go and fight. And he was hit by an airstrike 
and his leg was uh, chopped off and uh, there's a lot of story like this sadly a lot of children were used for the war they, they were forced to go if they refused to go they were beaten or even uh, savagely injured because they refused to go to the war to fight and uh, a lot of them were killed or uh, badly injured and that's just the boys I suppose the girls had a much uh, an equally bad fate even uh, worse even worse the girls and yeah, sadly 10 years old girls 11 years old girls were, were raped they were raped, they were given drugs, so they won't fight, and they were raped, a lot of them, sadly. Beast. This, the, 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 these men were evil. I, I don't know what to say. Oh, I guess my last question is, why do you do this work? Because this is not easy work. There are other things you could be doing. Why are you here? Because uh, it's wonderful to give back the hope for people. You have, you know, these people have, 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 they have nothing. They lost their, fa they lost their homes, they lost their uh, families, they lost their dignity, they, everything was taken from them. And it's nice to give, to give back hope. It's nice to give back hope. For, it's, it's nice to look at their face and, and uh, see the hope of a new life, of a better life in a different place. Because even here after they were released, they are living in camps in really bad conditions and you know, we're visiting them they are barely eating the, 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 they are living in tents next to each other there's no privacy nobody is working they cannot get you know, they stay in the same clothes for maybe a month because they cannot get any clothes it's very hard life here so it's 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 it's, a, it's actually really it's a good feeling to be able to help people to give them hope for, for, of a better life Throughout the day, there was a steady stream of Christian and Yazidi families coming in and out. Many of the refugees didn't want to speak to me on camera because they didn't want to speak publicly about their trauma and humiliations at the hands of ISIS, but others could not speak to me because they were concerned about reprisals from the Islamic State against them while they wait to be relocated, and many feared for the family members they were leaving behind. Some of the refugees were also coming from Christian towns in Iraq and Syria, fleeing the recent incursions from Turkey into the region. I was able to sit in on some screening interviews, all of which are being done by volunteers, to see the sorts of detailed vettings these Christian refugees have to go through just to start their paperwork to give to the Australian Embassy. In fact, all of the refugees processed that day in that conference room were headed to Australia because unlike Canada, Australia is one of the few remaining Western countries still prioritizing Christian and Yazidi survivors of genocide in their immigration queues. Now, while at that processing center in Dohuk, I also met with Syrian Christians who had just been rescued at the border between Syria and Iraq after hiding in the jungle with their children for five days. These refugees knew the risk they would face from Islamic State extremists by speaking to me, but they wanted the world to know just a bit of their story. What is it like to be a Christian in Syria? What kind of persecution do they face? So, when you become a Christian in Syria, how do you feel about the end of the war? How do you feel about the war? How do you feel about the war? How do you feel about the war? كنا عايشين ما نعرف يعني انه مين كان عم يحمينا ما عم نعرف صار القوي عم يجي يقول نحن بدنا نحمي المسيحيه يعني داعش طلب نحن نحمي المسيحيه الاكراد طلبوا نحن نحمي المسيحيه الدوله عم تطلب نحن نحمي المسيحيه فشفنا انه عم تضيع بيناتنا يعني اخر شيء بيعلقوا مع بعض هن عم يعلقوا نحن ضلينا بالنص يعني ما بقى نعرف مين هو اللي عم يحمينا اوكي سو هي سينج ذات ذا كريستيانز بيكيم ا ماينورتي ذير so everyone who comes there, they either threat them or they say, we will protect you. And at the end, like the Kurds fight with the regime forces, the regime forces fight with ISIS, ISIS fight with the Kurds and the Christians are in the middle. They are paying the biggest uh, bill for, for everything. Many died, many died because of the bombs. And, uh, and at the end, it's their lives, it's the, the, it's, it's the future of, their, of his family, but uh, no future in Syria. Many of the people left and too much threats there, many threats there, especially now no one knows what's next. So they don't want to pay the bill, that's it. 
what would happen to a Christian family like this one if they were captured by extremists? If they were captured by extremists. So from the families they know either they were slaughtered or uh, from the families who were captured it's where either they were executed or they or if let's say the extremists were needed money they asked them to pay money but they kept one of the family members with them so either they paid money or they were killed but when they pay money so so many were kidnapped they don't know where they are christians okay uh, many paid money and were able to go and others they forced them to convert their religion eh? so they were searching for I just were searching for the beautiful woman and they have the, sometimes it's it's good to be beautiful but in, in their cases it was very bad to be beautiful because they were searching for the beautiful girls they kidnapped them and they kept them with them they don't know anything about them the father robert told me after the interview that his little son's name means crucifix and like so many christians in the region they feel there's no hope and no future for them there nor for their children so they are leaving their ancestral christian home in hopes of finding peace to practice christianity freely in australia the aid workers indohook told me that they do have the capacity and the people to process even more refugees than they do. They just don't have the money to apply for more visas. Now my security team from White Mountain Research were also my fixers and my translators. Jawad George Abu Jaoud is the Middle Eastern Operations Manager for White Mountain Research. He's a Lebanese Christian, so he understands the plight of persecuted Christians in the Middle East because he is one himself. Jawad was able to connect me with persecuted refugees who are generally skeptical of outsiders who they feel are coming here to exploit their suffering for clicks and likes. One of the people Jawad was able to connect me with was a Yazidi boy named Saddam Hussein. He was kidnapped by ISIS and had recently been freed and had surgery to remove shrapnel from his leg just days prior. That surgery was funded by the Nazarene Fund. So this is our guy, uh, Saddam. Uh, uh, Saddam was uh, in captivity for four years. So he was 11 years old uh, when he was kidnapped. And uh, uh, he stayed there for around four years. So around April uh, 2019, the last, the, the last area in Syria was liberated from ISIS. And actually he was from the last group that stayed with ISIS. The last people who stayed there with ISIS, he was one of them. He was kidnapped with his father, his mother, and his uh, uh, siblings. The mother was released a uh, few years, couple of years ago with his sisters. Uh, he stayed with his father together. Then after two years, they took his father to another place. We believe that he was executed because many of the Yazidi men who are above 18 or 20 were Executed. We're not sure, but we think so. All right. The mother is in Canada. Okay. We also put them on a program to Canada, and they travel there. Unfortunately, we couldn't put them on a program to Canada. Uh, uh, now uh, they don't have a program to take the Yazidis for now. And he's happy to go to Australia with his uncle. Okay. Uh, now we're giving them all the support. We have a house for them for around one year. They are living in a tent. Uh, it's not good for him, especially for the kind of the mental uh, thinking in a way, because he was living also in a tent with ISIS. No one was taking care of them. They were beaten very in a very savage way. Uh, they had they pushed him to be a guard there, like on the checkpoints. Although he was 11 and 12 years old, so when he was shot there in Syria. He was begging them uh, not to take him to the battlefield or to stand on the checkpoints, but they used to beat him again and again to force him to do whatever they wanted to do. Although he was uh, 
where he couldn't walk and because of the sharpness in his body. And he's very thankful for what we are doing for him. And, uh, Hopefully, I'm sure we will be able to take him to Australia so we can start a new life. The thing here is that no one takes care of those people. We're not talk I'm not talking about us as an organization or a group of the Canadians or the Americans, but truly we are the only ones taking care of those people. So now we also, after the surgery, uh, we will put him on a program also, like with psychologists, we have organizations here. They all take money, this is the bad thing. So we have to put them on programs like that so they can talk to him. You know, five years are a lot. We, we will see if we can like put them, at least, at least like teach them English because they will be going to Australia. If they don't know, if they don't know the language, like they will lose more years of their lives. You know, to study English, to wait here for one year or two years or whatever. We're, we're sure that it will take around one year. So this is another year he's losing from his life. He's wasting from his life. Then he will go to Australia another one or two years to study English. So he can move forward and go to school. So he'll be 18 or 17. So almost all his childhood is... So uh, no more childhood, you know? Now, of course, the Nazarene Fund is, as the name implies, Christian-focused. However, they don't turn away anybody seeking help and the Yazidis know they can trust the Nazarene Fund to help them and not hold age-old bigotries against them. Saddam and his surviving family members are eventually headed off to Australia. Jawad and his team took me to meet three young Yazidi girls that they had rescued from the United Nations Internal Displaced Persons Sharia Camp. These three young Yazidi girls could not be alone in a camp run by Muslim locals who may still carry bigotry against Yazidis. And so part of what the Nazarene Fund has been doing in Iraq is getting the Christians and Yazidis out of the UN camps, away from the ongoing persecution they face inside, and moving them into secure housing while the Christians and Yazidis wait for their refugee paperwork to be processed to travel to their new homes. Hello. This is Almaz. They were all uh, kidnapped with ISIS. They were all in captivity. You will see them. So four members of the family, three sisters, one mother, three brothers, and the father are still missing. They don't know where they are. Uh, we don't want to predict things, but they are still missing, unfortunately. Hello. Keep going. Keep going. So, they were all in captivity, all of them. This is why we decided to bring them here. They have suffered a lot in captivity and uh, you know, we want them to feel a bit uh, better. Uh, we are not able to support them for now more than the house rent and a few funds for the living expenses. Uh, things like our Things are bad with them now because of the living expenses. They need to eat. No one is working. Uh, hopefully, we we are we are trying to like at least send them to schools. At least give them more money for the food packages for 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 medical care. We can't send them now to like to do like psychology that therapy like that uh, because of the funds. Hopefully, it will be better. Let's see how things go this month or next month. They are on an Australian program. Uh, and uh, hopefully they will be able to travel in the next year. We are hoping that. Okay, so uh, uh, Layla, so Layla, as I told you, she is a relative. Uh, Layla, so uh, Almas, Almas, the girl to the left, she was the last one uh, to, uh, to be rescued. We got her from inside Syria. Uh, we knew about them when, when, when ISIS retreated to inside to Idlib. Uh, we were able, like, uh, Layla, uh, Layla got a phone call from her and she said, I'm alone uh, in the middle of, of, the, of the desert, if you want to say. Everyone went away and uh, she was with a few other Yazidi girls. So we were able to go there and bring them in. They stayed around three years. Uh, unfortunately, Amma stayed for five years. She was with the same group of uh, the boy we met there, who the one we did the surgery for him. Uh, 
Saddam. She was with the same group, uh, not together, because usually they separated girls from boys. Okay, uh, we don't want to say it like, uh, uh, let me say it as it is. She was, uh, they were harassed uh, physically and uh, everything. Uh, maybe they don't prefer to say it. Uh, they won't say it to you now on here live, but uh, they suffered a lot. They treated them very badly. They, they beat them every day, uh, physically harassed, raped, all those things happened to them. Okay, uh, the mother was also kidnapped. Am I dead Ah, so so uh, so the mother was with Layla in captivity, and she was able to bring her uh, with her with her here, okay, uh, to Iraq. And then they thought that the girls like they were missing. They knew they were missing, but they thought they were they died or they were dead or because many air raids hit the place where they were. The other state in Mosul here and in, uh, on the borders. Uh, she was in Syria in Bogos. And they are the Almas and they are She's 21. She was 16 when she was kidnapped. The other into 16. So she was 12. She was uh, 13 when they were kidnapped. Now they are 16 and 17. Okay, they have three missing brothers and the father. They don't know where they are. This is like, uh, this is the biggest pain for them. We provided an English teacher for them. Uh, she was good and okay, but it's not like going to school. Oh, she's, uh, she likes to be an artist and uh, they, they are really, they are really aiming to go back to school. They are very sad because they, would, they weren't accepted here. You can see it on their face when I ask them. Uh, so uh, <coughs> now they want to go there, she want to be an artist, they want to study the language, they want to go to college, all of them actually. So uh, and I'm telling them, even if you waste some time from your life, it's okay, just put it way behind you and just keep, keep on walking. They need kind of uh, private schools and public schools, they are not accepting them. So. Uh, I don't know, we're trying to do like a small center for them where they can study English, where everyone can go there. Uh, it's not easy, it's not easy to establish the center. Uh, you know, it's for continuity, you need some more additional funds for that. They are sitting just at home, wasting their time, wasting their life, waiting, for, waiting to go to Australia. I know it will be much different in Australia, everything will change. They are building a very a great future, you know. This is why we don't want to leave them alone. We decided not to leave them alone. If, if it wasn't of us and of all the people in the States and Canada, we wouldn't, they, wouldn't have, uh, they wouldn't have been on an Australian program because they didn't know about it. They couldn't have money to go there, to apply, to, you know, to go to RBA, to do their interviews, to, to survive. So hopefully we can, uh, we can keep on uh, moving with this program just for the, for the sake of those poor people. That's it. There's not a lot of love for the United Nations in northern Iraq, and the Nazarene Fund is filling in the gaps that the United Nations is missing. Many in the West see the United Nations as saviors, as a force for good. In northern Iraq, the United Nations are seen as inept and corrupt, infected with bigotry against Christians who languish in the refugee camps. The camps are not a safe place for Christians, and sometimes the Christians are in the camps with their ISIS persecutors who masquerade as refugees so that they too can leave the country and ultimately flee the justice they deserve. Because of this, the Nazarene Fund often needs to deliver food aid to Christians in the UN internal displaced persons camps, even though the UN is supposed to and receives plenty of funding from the Western world to take care of the Christians there. Christians are often neglected in the camps because they're Christians. They're the last to eat, the last to get medicine, the last to get clothing, the last to get shelter, the last to get diapers for their babies, and the last to get out of the camps. And so it falls on NGOs and charities like the Nazarene Fund supported by you to help the Christians when the UN just doesn't seem to be able to. I spent the first part of my trip meeting Christians and Yazidis who want to leave Iraqi Kurdistan but many want to stay in their indigenous homeland. 
there are those that refuse to be purged from the land and who are returning to their destroyed towns. They need help to stay, to thrive and to practice their faith and to teach their children their faith. That's where Father Aram Ramil Hanan comes in. He's a staunch supporter of the restruction of the Christian villages in the Nineveh Plain because he's the parish priest in that destroyed Christian town of Batnaya. He spent the occupation of Batnaya in al Kosh, a place that is considered to be the oldest continuous Christian settlement on the face of the earth, a place that was just 20 kilometers from the ISIS front line. Father Aram has built a center in al Kosh to shepherd Christians in the region through the trauma of ISIS and back into their home communities. Friends, um, it's an honor to us to have you today in our center. Uh, I'm in charge for a new trauma center in Iraq and I'm our priest of Batnaya, uh, Sid Batnaya uh, village. Uh, it's a uh, uh, damaged uh, village. It was occupied by ISIS for three years. This is Batnaya. This is my parish here. Uh, ISIS occupied it first Mosul, first time. Then went to uh, occupied Nineveh Plan. So they pushed all the Christian out. Father Aram told me that the day Batnaya was liberated, Kurdish forces came to get him. Because if the priest came back, so would the people. From al Kosh. We rode with Father Aram, past the berms pushed up to slow the approach of ISIS all the way to Batnaya, to a place where they still say Mass in Aramaic. And as we drove, Father Aram told me that the Iranian militias were now turning up in the Nineveh plain. Father Aram drove me through his town to show me the destruction, but also to show me what he's building for the returning Christians, a catechism school, the women's center, the daycare, the diesel generators he uses to turn the power on in town and to illuminate the cross on his church. He even used the tombstones from the cemetery ISIS destroyed as building supplies. <laughs> So, it's a catechism center. It's catechism center, youth center, women center. Three of one. <laughs> We are using it, use it like a center. <laughs> Father Aram took me to his Chaldean Catholic Church to show me the ISIS graffiti that remains, to show me the bullet holes that still are in the walls, and to show me that while these are reminders of the persecutions of Christians in the region, that he is not scared and he is never leaving. Now, before we left Batnaya, we met with a Christian family who has come back to Batnaya, but they still don't have power. However, they are never leaving. Two Christian families came back to Batnaya the day the Kurds came to get Father Aram. Now 70 are back and Father Aram's church was full for Christmas Mass. On my final day in Iraq, Jawad and the team from White Mountain Research took me to meet with some Christian women who had just fled from their homes after Turkey began an armed offensive into northern Syria, a place where there are many Christian communities. These women one of whom is pregnant, turned up at the border with Iraqi Kurdistan and were rescued by the White Mountain Research Team. What would happen to her and her family, her unborn child, if she's forced to go back home? Uh, you, you mean now? If they, so, uh, so the thing is that uh, they were threatened many times. So the, the extremists and especially the villagers and maybe the Kurds, they know who they are. 
and now they know that they left all right so uh, if they go back there it will be more dangerous for them so they will know that uh, that they tried to escape but they couldn't make it so they have and they went back there okay now uh, now the war has not ended yet in syria so erdogan said a few days ago that uh, that he will attack again okay they said that maybe that the christian villages will not be in danger although they will occupy them but it's not true they always say like that but the, you you can never know what the extremist groups will do okay we know what they will do and we know how they rape many people we know how they how they treat women especially women and beautiful women so this is why we are trying to save those women okay uh, i will ask her if she spoke to her husband and uh uh التليفون هلا اليوم الصبح كان نحكي كتابه اه بس بالكتابه وقال لك مش حاله غسل على قال هلا على حدود نحن رح نفتح اوكي سو هي جاست انفورمد هير اكشلي وي انفورمد هير يسترداي بس هي وزنت ايبل تو توك تو هير يسترداي بيكوز هي واز ستيل ستاك اون ذا بوردرز سو ناو هي كروس ذا بوردرز اند وي هاف جايز ذير هو بروت ذيم ان تو ذا يو ان بيس از اي تولد يو يسترداي Uh, we cannot bring him directly to the to the Kurdish territories, to the Iraqi territories. He, we have to bring him first to to get him first to the UN base. There they will try to do the first vetting with him. And why did you? How did you come in? And why did you come in? Okay. So she spoke to him in the morning, and they uh, uh, he's at the UN base now. What's the UN? And at the border, eh? Okay, okay. So now they will take him to the UN base. But do short work on it. But so no, we will we will sponsor him, so we can bring him out of the base. Otherwise, he will stay there. So he has two options. Uh, they have two options actually. If 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 no one sponsors him, it's either they uh, it's either they uh, send him back. to the Syrian territories and they tell him just go in the forest in the jungle and go back home or they keep him in the UN base forever and they don't care that he's separated from his pregnant wife usually no 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 not at all he can t- so if his wife wasn't here we, we, we know how to to do those things so if his wife wasn't here maybe they would have sent him back here but we brought his wife first here we tried to like uh, play it in a good strategic way Uh, so they called they called the wife and they were sure she was here and then it was like kind of uh, it gave them the, the good decision to let him uh, in uh, at the borders okay when she goes to australia if that's where she ends up going what does she want to do when she gets there so i'm just like i want to hala bas to go to australia شو عم تفكروا تعملوا شو في انا كيف كفوا حياتكم يعني. So now she said that she's pregnant and she wants to have a good, uh, a good life for her kid. This is the first thing, and to start working there and uh, continue their education. There. Yeah. And actually, just one thing about her husband. Uh, he helped Christians a lot in Syria. He's, they are Christians, and her husband. Uh, you, we, we will. Uh, you will meet. Maybe we will. We can take some videos for him later on. But this guy helped Christians a lot in Syria. He, he saved many Christians there, also Yazidis, and he worked with uh, with good organizations who like uh, took care of Christians and minorities. So uh, for us, he's a hero. So her husband is really. A, he's a great man. So, yeah. And and uh, and this is why the extremist groups and other groups, uh, they wanted like you know to eliminate him or kill him anyway because he was working helping all those people uh, there, and you know usually extremists do not like people like that. Yeah. And yeah, and by the way, uh, her sister-in-law was rescued by us also. Shamiram. She was rescued by us, Shamiram, with her son, and Shamiram and her son is in Canada now. We were able to put them on a Canadian program, and she is uh, she is in Canada now. She is in Ontario. She traveled uh, like uh, a month ago. I'm thinking, 
Shaminat. It's a bit Shaminat. Yeah, around a month ago, she traveled. We were able to send her to Canada, and uh, she's happy there with her son. Okay, so we are rescuing also uh, Jima's uh, sister, Akhta. Yes. Jima's sister with her husband. Okay, and two of her and and their kids. Okay, they have two kids. So we will we will rescue them next week, and bring and we will bring them here. Where are they? It's still in Syria. Okay, so we will do the rescue next week, and we will bring them here. So we are kind of reuniting the family. We ask Ahlik ma bado nijo. Hala. Hene hala ma bi adu uh, let me tell you one thing about uh, bringing people in through the borders. Uh, when, when, the, when the war started a month ago, we tried to bring two old people. Uh, we co they couldn't make it. They were very, very old. The, the woman was kind of 75 or 80 years old. She was sick. Uh, she couldn't cross uh, the trenches, the big, uh, like the huge trenches, because she couldn't climb on them and we couldn't carry her. Uh, so we had to bring her back. Because uh, like things like that might affect the whole team or might affect the other uh, people who are being rescued. So uh, we we couldn't br we couldn't bring in her parents, the father and the mother. But we will try to bring them in through the airport because they couldn't come in like uh, at the borders. So we try to do that. But her sister-in-law and her husband, uh, her sorry, her uh, brother, uh, will be rescued next week with two with two kids, two small kids. We will update you, we'll keep you updated about that. Yes. But I'm quiet. Okay. So, uh, what else? Okay, and next week we'll, have, we'll move them, we will move her with her husband to a, to a new house. Okay, we had another case, a third case. Uh, she was also rescued last week. Uh, she couldn't be here because she is, at the, she is uh, with the intelligence now. We have one of our guys with her. They are doing the vetting with her so they can give her the permanent visa. Christian women like those I had just met with who are waiting to leave but are displaced persons with no jobs and no homes and the Yazidi girls that I had met with earlier also receive food aid from the Nazarene Fund just like the Christians and Yazidis who languish in the UN camps do. The Nazarene Fund and their in-country partners use hotel conference rooms, community centers, and even parking lots to distribute food hampers to these families who are living and waiting for their new homes abroad. Now, I took a look at these hampers and it was meager, bare necessities, flour, tea, sugar, rice, cooking oil, just enough to get these survivors of the genocide through yet another month as they wait sometimes up to a year to leave Iraqi Kurdistan for their new homes abroad. Now, I got on the plane back home to Canada, feeling proud of the difference the fundraising campaign was making in the lives of Christians who want to leave Iraqi Kurdistan and in the lives of those who want to stay. I also felt confident enough with what I had seen to fundraise some more. The White Mountain research team told me it can cost anywhere between two and $5,000 to support a Christian family per month outside of a UN camp, with medical care, housing, food, English language training, job training, counseling, emotional support, clothing, and escorted travel to and from all their appointments, because these Christians are unfortunately still targets of Islamic State holdovers. So I asked our viewers and supporters for a starting goal of $10,000 to help two or five Christian families as an advent project. I blew past my goal and raised nearly $30,000. Targeted for violence and shunned by Western governments, there were once 1.5 million Christians in Iraq. Today, the number has been reduced to just 200,000. They are being murdered in their churches while we forget about them in ours. The Western world, the Western church, that has an obligation to help, have both miserably failed the Christians on the Nineveh plain. It's not enough to pray. We have to be their voices. 
and we have to pressure those who can to act before Christianity is exterminated entirely on the Nineveh Plain. For Rebel News, I'm Sheila Gunn-Reed. To support the work I'm doing here to document the plight of Iraqi Christians and to help us give the gift of freedom and safety to one or two Iraqi Christian families this Advent, go to savethechristians.com.